Good evening, everyone. My name is Anika Lovelace. I hope everybody's tucked in. Perhaps you have a coffee nearby, perhaps, but we're virtual, so there's that. <laughs> but welcome tonight. I'm glad. I'm so grateful that you guys stopped by to hear a little bit about what we're planning for your potential students and making sure that they are prepared for the science world and beyond. So we just wanted to go through a few slides with you just to introduce you, get sort of your, give you sort of the spoiler alert, if you will, of some of the things that your students may be interacting with if they join us here at Fairhaven. So next slide. All right, so I hope everybody has their coffee. <laughs> so my name again is Ms. Anika Lovelace, and I have been teaching science for 27 years. I started to believe. I have a bachelor's in biology, master's in teaching, nonprofit management. Probably more importantly, I've taught several different types of classes throughout the years, including AP biology and nutrition science, environmental science. And so that's the basis of how I came up with many of the activities and many of the concepts that you, your student will be learning. I've been a Montessori proponent and Montessori has always been one of my leaders and one of my mentors um, throughout the years. I went to a Montessori school when I was in third through, no, I'm sorry, first through third and loved it as a student. I have a daughter who is a Butler alum and she was there for most of her schooling from 2014 to 2022. And now I'm here left to <laughs> continue my dream of working with the Montessori community with my science background. So that's sort of my spiel about me. But more importantly, next slide, let's look at what we have in store for your students. So our evening together, I'm just going to go over briefly because I want to hear, I guess, sort of give you again a backdrop, but I want to hear some of your questions and perhaps suggestions to best serve your student. But we start with the foundation. So our Fairhaven science is from the public schools for uh, what we would in public school consider grades 10 through 12, that three-year cycle. So what you'll see here in cycle A, B, and C is that whenever your student attends Fairhaven, we may be in year cycle A or B or C, but we will recycle those concepts each year. So by the time your student leaves, they will have all three cycles under their belt. So we're gonna go through each cycle so you can kind of piece together how this is all gonna to work together. And then of course, towards the end of our time, we'll open it up for questions and hopefully our answers. <laughs> Next slide. All right, so again, Maria Montessori is definitely one of my heroes, uh, not only as a scientist, because she was also trained as a physician, uh, but also as an educator. So. One of the things I love about her um, focus on the adolescent is that she understood that they are to be valued and not only not based on their behavior or not based on some of the things they may say or do, but because they are, uh, they have value, they have intrinsic value and in what, of course, their potential of, as they move through into adulthood. So I wanted to just make sure that as you're looking through this curriculum, that you see how we're valuing not only their prior experience and perhaps in middle school or elementary, upper L as well, but also what we, how they see themselves moving forward and that they indeed have value um, and we value their value <laughs> most importantly. So hopefully you can kind of see that thread as we look at some of the cycles and particularly the themes that we're working at. Next slide. Okay, so our Fairhaven science is built on three themes that are interdisciplinary. So we mentioned each year has a, has a theme and those themes can relate and will relate to all of the levels or all of the content sciences. So next slide, let's look at those themes. Before we go there, can I say- Oh, please. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. 
Perfect. So, so some of you uh, have students who are in the intermediate program or had students or will have students. Um, but I opportunity to just speak really briefly about the way the sciences are structured in the in the seventh, eighth, and ninth years, so that you can see how that really lays a foundation for what they then receive in the Fairhaven program with 10th, 11th, and 12th. So in the intermediates, the goal is to introduce students to the three main branches of science, which sort of, you know, like universally, we would say the three main branches of science would be physical science, earth science, and uh, life sciences. So when I look back over all of the different units that they receive over the course of three years, right, if we're going to do something with physical sciences, you know, they're, they're studying engineering, they're doing architecture right now um, with Mr. Jones, um, we've done astronomy, we've done chemistry, uh, we've done simple machines as well. When you look at some of the earth sciences that they've done, we've done studies of water and energy, as well as biodiversity and for life sciences, I just finished up a unit on genetics, which was fabulous. But we also studied marine science in connection to some of the places that we've been on some of our spring trips, as well as evolution, anatomy, and physiology, and things like that. But the intermediates are studying this for about a month at a time intensely. So they're getting just like the little, the little taste of what this discipline is and what's interesting about it and what captures their interest. So by the time they have done three years in the intermediates, moving on to Fairhaven, they, they have a pretty good understanding of these three main branches of science. Their opportunity as 10th, 11th, and 12th years is to dive into those more deeply and to really understand what are these different disciplines, how do they connect to each other, and where do they see their own focuses and interests within these branches of science. So that's sort of my giving you the overview of how the intermediate program prepares them to then go into what's happening here. Okay, so another theme that I hope you also see as we talk tonight is that while we are preparing them for, while they will be prepared for different tests that we know is part of our reality in education, that's not necessarily going to be our focus. We want them to be independent learners and to grow in that in independence so that they can, whether they choose to do AP exams or if they choose to um, move into another realm of science or another well, realm of academia, they will be prepared because they will be independent learners. So we wanna, hopefully you'll see through what we're sharing that that in independence is what we really want to hone in on. Thank you. All right, here are our themes. Okay, so <laughs> the theme names are up at the top and then to relate them to what either your student, as Ms. Rodwin already mentioned, she is already planting the seeds of all three of these sciences in them so that when they get into this Fairhaven program that they will just sort of blossom more. We'll go into more of the high school concepts and like I said, more college level with a nod to some of the AP sciences. So the first theme is energy and movement. And so Ms. Robin already mentioned about simple machines. So we're gonna build on that. Uh, we know our body is a machine, right? So, and we also understand that we energy is required for all machines in different forms. So we are going to be talking about, and I'll, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but when we break that theme down, as you can see, even though it's chemistry and physics is sort of our focus, you can see where we're also can draw into earth and environmental sciences and definitely biology. Um, so I'm hoping you see sort of those threads moving forward, although we are going to um, lean in on uh, the concepts and the content that's on the bottom. Global health and sustainability, as we again want our students to become the, the community, a member of the community and perhaps a community leader, we want them to understand the world around them and the science within that world around them. And then systems and balance. Uh, again, if you think of your body and living systems, again, the main concept that we're going to explore 
is the concept of homeostasis. And probably some of you have heard of that concept. It's a fancy word for just meaning we want your body and most living systems all wanna stay within range, all right? So your blood pressure, your heart rate, all wanna stay in balance, all right? So as we move through these themes, again, we're gonna be picking up from all different content, but the focus is going to be primarily the content that's at the bottom of the screen. All right, let's see. So cycle A, here we go. What we are, uh, Ms. Robin and I were considering sort of building sort of a trimester theme in our work to kind of encapsulate a lot of the concepts, but also have it very, still very fluid as we go through the year. So September to November, or the fall months, we'll be looking at the transfer of light and or energy. So we know that the sun is a primary source of energy and how that then gets transferred to different forms of energy, whether it be chemical, physical, et cetera. So we're going to be looking at how that light is can be trans, transformed or transferred to different forms of energy. And then once it's transferred, we will be looking at how that could be used in different and movement in different systems. So not only the biological, but also roller coasters, for example. So we'll be looking at the physical um, and chemical, and then also biological moving forward. Um, towards the end of the year is when the students, like I said, we value what they understand and we value them as learners. And so we want them to look back at what we've learned, the transfer of energy, transfer of light, mechanics of movement, and then explore different applications of those. And perhaps one student may look into photography and do a portfolio on different types of photography, again, transferring the light and energy um, into a photograph and how the mechanics and the science behind that photograph and how to do that well. Or some folks <laughs> may want to study roller coasters or the zip line at Butler that's already there. How does that work? How can we make sure that's safe? How does that pulley system allow us to move across the campus, but then safely? So that's how we then start applying not only what's here at the Butler campus, but also what they're interested in. So we want them to apply what they've learned um, in the first couple of the first half or the first um, two trimesters of two thirds of our year. All right, let's head on to our next theme and cycle, um, global health and sustainability. So we just arbitrarily are calling these A, B, and C. Again, as your student comes in, we may be in the C cycle, right? And then the next year we go on to A. So these are just arbitrarily. One doesn't necessarily have to be first, for example. All right, so here we are in global sustainability and health. We want to look at the chemical nature and the matter that make up our earth and how they then cycle and how matter is continuously cycling, taking on different forms and in different molecules and in different systems, but it all is cycled. We first look at the individual chemicals <clears throat> Um, but then we want to see how they are then transferred through Earth in particular and conservation as well. So this is where we would talk more about the environmental, climate change, whether those types of topics would be sort of filtered into our work December to February. And then, like we mentioned for the last for the last cycle, give them now a chance to start looking at their diet. What what nutrients are in their diet? What nutrients do they need? What nutrients perhaps as Americans we maybe have too much of, like fat and salt? And why? Why is that why is that part of our diet? Or why how can we change our diet to have more of nutrient-packed um, foods? Also the concept of making sure we understand, again, globally, things like food deserts, right? Where there are certain, where food is not as readily available. 
and sort of looking beyond ourselves here in Darnstown, but also projecting out to places where there may not be food and why, and are we able to then to grow food? What foods can we grow in this area versus that area? And sort of more outreach towards making that a, their ability to then see what problems there are and then try to solve them or at least address them in a different area. And then let's head to year or letter C, <laughs> systems imbalance. And again, this year is gonna be more sort of have the life science tent to them. And as you can see, as we're evaluating systems, one of the, for our human body, one way we know how to evaluate how well our system is working is through vital signs, right? Your heart rate, breathing rate, et cetera. But then we're going to look at other systems and how we can tell, for example, if we do our ability then to go outside and look at our water quality. Is that too, is the acidity level too high? Are there different solutes too high, the turbidity? So we're going to evaluate more than just our human body, but then also are looking at, at our environment as a body of sorts, right? So, or a system at least. Change and stability is gonna, as you can see, many of you probably recognize that structure as DNA. So one of the things that we also like to look at is how different mutations may change that stability. So we all know of some genetic diseases already, right? And how change of one, nucleotide or a couple of nucleotides or a couple of base pairs can cause sickle cell anemia, for example, and how that one change may then uh, result in physiological changes as well. So sort of taking that concept of change and sometimes, like we know, our body is able to regulate that, but some changes our body is not. And so looking at that through a genetics lens will sort of be our focus for that. And then we want to, again, add, I guess, application and look at the, not only the cultivating, the crops that we have cultivating at Butler, but also some of our animal, the animals that we take care of. So now that we know our body, we now can look into how to better take care of the animals that we are charged with, that we have here at Butler and that and crops as well. How can we make sure those systems have are being regulated and have what they need to do well? Also sort of our microeconomy uh, concept we always love and that also adds value to our adolescents is to be able to produce something that they can then market and sell. Uh, my daughter was a huge proponent of that. Uh, she loved baking and the such. And so, but in this case, we're going to look back at how can we sustain these organisms, but also use what they're producing as something that they can be sold in, in our microeconomy. So we, we, are taking care of the animals and the field and the crops that we have, but also then what they produce can also be used to help uh, sustain the farm, sustain um, our program as well. So that's kind of the sort of add, adds a sort of the bird's eye view, of course, of our curriculum. And I will, I, is uh, Emma, did I, is there anything that you, feel I need to hone in more or that you? No, just... I think it, it gives a great overview of how all of the, everything is very, is interdisciplinary. And I, I mean, those who know me know that I'm a huge proponent of this because we don't, the, the world doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? And so the more that we help our adolescents to understand how everything is interrelated with one another, I think that that's so valuable for, for life, right. And for, for seeing systems and how they connect. So um, I personally think <laughs> this curriculum is genius because it has both the interdisciplinary um, pieces that it needs, but it also is honing in on specific areas and making sure that um, students have the, 
the basis and the foundation that they need to then tackle some of these subjects further um, in higher education if that's what their um, what their goal is. Okay, thank you. So I guess should we open it up for questions? I would love to hear some questions from our audience. I guess either from the chat or um, do they have the ability to unmute? I assume they do. Well, I have to play devil's advocate because, you know, it's part of being a Montessorian. Um, do they have to take all three years of science? for Before they come? No, in order to graduate. Oh, I guess that would be up to, I guess, our administration. I can tell you the answer to that question, but you need to give me a second to find my notes on that. So please hold. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody else has another question in the meantime, please go for it. Yeah, hi, this is Kier. I heard in our last session, I guess, about dual enrollment with Montgomery College. Is that envisioned as part of the uh, science curriculum? Uh, Emma, do you want to share? Sure. So... I think so the the short answer to your question is yes, right? Um, the longer answer is it really depends on the student. So if um, there is a student who is um, expressing a particular interest or aptitude in a particular area and wants to do their studies at um, dual enrollment with Montgomery College so that they are receiving college, credit for that, then yes, absolutely. As we know, Montgomery College runs on a semester system rather than a trimester system. So all that means is that if they're choosing to do their spring semester taking, I don't know, chemistry 101 or something like that, then um, we would then sort of adjust the fall semester to ensure that they have whatever prerequisites they need to be successful in that college course. And at the same time, still still, still getting the important pieces that they need for all of the different areas of science, but perhaps focusing in particular in that area because they have that interest. For those who don't, and this is probably useful for everybody about AP versus dual enrollment. Actually, Anika, maybe you want to take that and talk about like what AP gives you versus straight dual enrollment? Definitely. So AP, the advanced placement concept is to present college level concepts in a high school environment. So the content is definitely college level, but how it's presented, at least in the public school system, is with homework and you know, little quizzes, and that's generally not the teaching pattern or teaching methods of an actual college. So for AP, they will have the content. And so I used a lot of the content for each of the AP. So again, that's AP Biology, AP, AP Chem, AP Physics, and AP Environmental Science. So I use those four curriculums to build what we have here. So if your student, and again, like uh, Ms. Robin already mentioned, we want to know as the student enrolls what their interests are so that we can make sure they as an individual or those, the other folks that are have that same interest are prepared. So it's very customized in that sense. We will hone in on, as I mentioned in one of the slides before, some of the like chemistry and physics, for example, as we're honing in on that on cycle A, they would then by that spring semester share with us that they are interested, or I should hopefully they would tell us before that, but use that March to June to prepare for that AP test, which is generally in May. And then the next year would be AP environmental science. Again, knowing at the beginning of the year that they're interested in taking it, we can make sure that we're sprinkling in all of the content. So by that March, June situation, we are in hardcore prep for that particular assessment. And then lastly, for cycle C, biology. So again, as we mentioned, because it's interdisciplinary, they're getting biology throughout all the years. They're getting chemistry throughout all the years. They're getting environmental science throughout the years. So we just build each year. 
so that so technically they could take the, the NAP exam in a year. Um, but I guess it would be probably more advantageous if they wait until that year that we're actually honing in on it, if that hopefully that makes sense. Um, also, I have an answer to Lisa's question about do they need to take three years of science, which I am going to drop in the chat. Um, but according to <laughs> Maryland state law, um, which I love that Natasha's nodding because she knows these regulations super well, uh, that in order to graduate from high school from a private school in the state of Maryland, um, students need four credits in English language arts, two credits in social studies, and at least one of them has to be U.S. history. And they say six credits of science and math, at least two in each of them, with nine additional credits for electives and things like that. So if you look at those six credits of math and science, yes, you need at least two years of science and you need at least two years of math. But for the other two, you could do another science and another math, or you could do two sciences or you could do two maths. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Hi, this is Jess. How does that credit end up working with the fact that we're talking about a three-year cycle versus a four-year traditional high school? So because now we're looking at high school curricula, I feel like we've like moved the goalposts a little bit where it's like before I had to get them into high school and now I have to get them into college. So when you look at what the colleges are looking for, the bright side actually is that colleges are way more open to a more open and more interested, I would say, for a non-traditional high school education. But basically what they need to see is that students have taken students have taken like foundational courses in a variety of different subjects. They don't have specific requirements to say they have to have taken chem and they have to have taken bio and that kind of thing. I actually think the colleges will be much more interested in looking at the way our curriculum is designed and knowing because we provide them in our school profile with our curriculum and how everything is laid out, they're gonna see very quickly, right? Oh yes, they have their bio, they have their chem, they have all of these things. For Maryland, for the state of Maryland, they already approved us to have a high school. So I don't need to, they, like, they have already said, yes, the curriculum that you have provided us with shows us that you have a plan to produce all of these things. So yes, you have students who can graduate from Butler Montessori High School. So I feel like, Jess, I sort of talked about that at two angles. So like Maryland State, we're good. And then for colleges, they're looking at they're looking at all of this and saying, oh, that seems cool, right? This kid can really learn. That's the goal. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i listening to the curriculum and I, I guess my question was more specifically to Maryland itself because, I mean, I love the way there's, you know, everything kind of builds on everything else and there's a lot of interplay and you're also bringing in like social equity into the science curriculum. It's just I do really like how that builds and it's a general like whole world view versus like you said, specific biology, specific chemistry and specific physics. But how does that all, like we're kind of talking overview. What What is the nitty gritty of it? Are they, do they have access? I know we had talked before, like we'd find access somehow to a chemistry lab are they doing experiments under a hood? Like how are they getting that type of hands-on experience? Excellent question. And that is based on the my experience and what we have planned for each year and for each sort of interdisciplinary unit is that many of the labs, and like I said, I teach high school already, is we're using what I like to call kitchen labs, meaning we will use lemon juice, for an acid. So that's not something we necessarily need a fume hood or something, uh, a lot of equipment. However, as they get into the AP level, there is, because it's a college level of content, they are expecting, to your point, they're expecting specific like titrations and stoichiometry, and which will require us to either 
purchase that equipment and or build partnerships with neighboring either academic institutions or, um, I lost my choo-choo, or commercial um, industry to partner with us. And also internships. I forgot to mention that because uh, we want kids to be in that field to try it out. And so hopefully through those partnerships, we would be able not only to run the labs that we need to, but also sort of guide them into more of a career exploration concept all at the same time. <laughs> so I'm not sure if that answered your question, but so let me know if that tackled it. I'll just add really quickly mm-hmm. that yes to to Anika's point that as many of the labs that we can do in-house, like that's what we do right now in the intermediates is all the labs that we do can be done in-house at Butler Montessori. So as many of the labs that in the in the Fairhaven program that we can do just, just in-house at Butler, we will. Anika was sharing with me that a lot of schools are moving to digital models for a lot of these labs so that they are more easily accessible to schools that don't have as many resources resources as others do, and especially in COVID, had to become very inventive with how they were preparing students for this. So as many, you know, physical labs that we can do at Butler, we will, as many digital simulation labs that we can do that are accessible, we will. And then anything that doesn't fall into those two categories, I'm still in touch with Montgomery College and USG, the universities at Shady Grove, to talk to them about using their space. But also, I am still in the process of reaching out to other private schools in our area area who might be larger than we are and have some lab space and would be willing to let us come in and use it at some point. I was saying it, MCPS will never go for that, but I'm sure a if I if I beg some private schools in our area, they're they're pretty friendly. Like Natasha can attest to this that there really is a community around private schools in our area that we know each other well and we're willing to help each other out. So that's sort of the plan for the nitty-gritty. Does that does that make sense? That does. Thank you. I um, thank you for that presentation. That um, I love the interdisciplinary approach. And beyond the labs, I was curious about print materials. Have you found are there existing print materials that align with the three-year plan that you laid out? Just curious about that. Good question. So a lot of things, as the kids say, just Google it. (laughs) And not saying that we, uh, but a lot of things, even just as I teach uh, on a daily basis, I'm grabbing a lot of things that other teachers have produced. And it's quite a community out there (laughs) of teachers that are sharing with other teachers. And so they have also brought in a lot of text material, official text that we can do. We'll do a lot of, I know for, as I teach anatomy and physiology, I'll bring in when we watch the word, the movie Concussion, we actually read the paper, the, the, the research paper of Dr. Amalu. And so that's, that's the beauty of science that a lot of those texts are uh, readily available. And that's where I want because we didn't really mention literacy, scientific literacy and discourse. And so we'll be leaning on the other um, teachers in Fairhaven to kind of throw in some interdisciplinary uh, literature and literacy because a scientist is not a scientist unless they can read, write and speak. So we want to make sure that those basic abilities along with the content. So yes, we will definitely have a library of sorts. And I know Butler already has books, the official textbooks, and I know that's a dirty word in Montessori, but we will have reference material for them. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Don Vogel messaged this question to me, but he meant to do it to everybody. So <laughs> I'm just I'm just going to read it. He said, when you refer to quote unquote needed labs, what will be the balance between student generated inquiry and curriculum mandated specific investigations? Oh, that's a great question. Because that I and again, as um, as a teacher currently, I normally give them sort of the concept that I want them to get. And then for the variables, for those that are familiar with sort of research science, where uh, each I allowed each 
team or each group, student group, to choose their variables. So in a sense, I'm guiding, It's I think technically it's called guided inquiry first, where they choose their variables. So if they want to test limits of tolerance on a plant, how much salinity can this particular crop that we're growing at Butler versus another one, what amount of salt or other nutrients can they withstand and still grow? So the student would be able to choose either the type of plant that they want to research. So in that way, it's somewhat inquiry. After we finish that, then they can extend into something, hey, Ms. Lovelace, I'm thinking I want to do limits of tolerance, but not just of salt, but of sun exposure, right? And so that then builds into, now that they understand the concept of limits of tolerance, that it's sort of that bell curve, right? Where in the middle of it, it's, yep, I'm happy, I'm going to grow. But towards the tail end of each side, it's not so much. So then I wanted them to take that a step further and then they would be able to kind of go with it and look at other uh, variables or look at other systems. And I'll just add here as well that if, if a student is prepping for a specific AP exam, there are labs, you know, from the AP curriculum that they need to have completed in order to be as successful as possible on the exam at the end. So if if that's their goal and that's the the pathway that they have expressed an interest in, then yes, those those needed labs they have to do. If they are not that interested in taking an AP exam and they're like, I just love science and I just want to learn it the way that I want to learn it, then that opens up a little bit of a wider realm for them to have more student-generated inquiry. And so with within the topic area that we are, I mean, this is how I do it in the intermediate, is that like within the area that we are studying, what is it about this particular concept that interests you? How would you like to test that? And then it becomes student generated from there. Obviously with intermediate students, there's a little bit more guidance. And then with the Fairhaven students that they can, they can do so much more on their own with that independence. So can loosen the reins a little bit. It's one of the things I'm most excited about. Oh, yes. This is Kira again. How many hours a week do you anticipate working on on these science science curriculum? This is a great question, and it's something that I'm still I'm still thinking about a little bit. But in order to get the state certification, they were like, "What's your schedule going to look like?" And I was like, "Oh, fun! I get to put together what I think this schedule should look like." So the way I designed it, they have at least I think I have two. I have at least one full three hour cycle in there where they're getting three hours a week and then potentially doing two, three hour cycles a week. So that would be six hours in a week, which would, which, which is a, a significant amount of time. I mean, if you, Anika can weigh in on this, if you're taking science at MCPS, they're getting how, how many hours a week? <laughs> if they do, if they do bell to bell, it's again, about five, five hours, give or take. Much less, actually, because it's only, well, we only have 45 minute periods. So yeah, that is definitely improved. And the cool thing about the block is that we have the time to do the labs, because that's one of the little, you know, petty things I have about uh, our current school systems, but, you know, you have to um, get ready for the next class and the kids don't have time to process and, and work through the labs. So that's definitely um, a win-win. So yeah, so if in the public schools, they're getting, you know, 45 minute blocks, five days a week. So you're looking at about four and a half hours. That is the right math, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even if Lisa's not here, she'd be like, come on, Emma. Um, <laughs> but but exactly, but, you know, to the, the Montessori method, having the opportunity to get in that state of flow and exploration where you're focusing on one thing fairly intensely, I think is really positive. In the intermediate, they're doing these like two hour cycles in the afternoon that have proven to be really positive. So at least, at least a three hour cycle, but then also, how do I explain this? Like, I'm also intending to give them time for, to do individual exploration during the week that isn't necessarily just like 
class time. So, because if you think about college, for example, right? You you have your class schedule, it's all laid out. What do you do in the time that you're not in class? Well, it's up to you. You should be probably studying and doing reading if your college experience was anything like mine and making sure that you're feeding yourself and you're taking care of yourself. So the goal of the Fairhaven schedule is that it has some of the same kind of flexibility where they're receiving regular lessons and they're keeping up with the curriculum that has been designed for them, but they have these periods of time of exploration so that they can do the work that they need to do, do the reading they need to do, ask for help if they need it to keep moving forward. So if I had to ballpark it, I would say anywhere between three to six hours in a week, but I I can't say exactly at this moment how many hours because- I haven't fully settled on the schedule yet. I promise I will by next year, though. So. Does that answer your question, Tier? It does, thanks. Hey, Ms. Rodwin. On, on that note, um, if dual enrollment is a thing, like how practical would that be from a scheduling perspective, right? Because if you are looking at traditional school, we're talking about half a day in, on campus in their school and then half a day in college. Seeing that we have to, <laughs> we want the kids to breathe and make up their own agenda and, and have the Montessori experience, like with something like a dual enrollment, even a possibility. So what's really cool about doing this, I learned this with Montgomery College, is that what's great about doing dual enrollment as a private school is that you don't have to sign up for a program like like MCPS has the MC squared program, the, the middle college program, where those students are doing, um, by the time they finish their high school career, they are also receiving an associate's degree from Montgomery College. So as so they they start to layer on more and more courses so that by the time that they're a senior, they're taking most, if not all of their courses at Montgomery College. And I'm looking at Anika and she's nodding. So <laughs> I know that Northwest does this. With private schools, you have much more flexibility. So students can say, I want to take a class at Montgomery College this semester. And they can do that, right? So in terms of scheduling, it depends, of course, on what is that class? Where does it meet? Montgomery College has three different campuses. They also do courses online as well. Um, so we would need to know. So we would be in conversation with them to say, and they're saying, yes, I want to take English 101 at the Germantown campus of Montgomery College. Well, when does that class meet? And how will you build, again, everything is, it's the student's responsibility. How will you build to the rest of your schedule around the fact that you want to make this commitment? So, you know, we are flexible enough to be able to say, yes, you can take this course here. Yes, we have someone available for you here. But the responsibility is really on them to design their schedule. Again, the way you would in college, design your schedule so that you're getting everything that you need. You're you're building it in such a way that is not you're not going to burn out from that. And that's why we have adults who are acting as guides and advisors for them. Right. To say, wow, I don't think you need to take you know, six classes at Montgomery College all in one semester. That is insane. And, and so helping them to find the balance, helping them to build their schedule. And then of course, working with their parents, if they cannot yet drive or don't have a car or public transportation to get there, how will you get there and back again, right? Depending on when, when your class meets. So I know that was sort of a long roundabout answer, but really it, it, it is the responsibility of the student and we are co- whatever decision is best for them. That makes sense. I didn't know it was that flexible, actually. I thought it was all or nothing. So it's good to hear. It's I, I've learned a lot in this process about what all these different institutions will. And I'm cheered living in Montgomery County. We're, we're lucky, right? That we have a lot of resources at our disposal where we live. And I'd like to take advantage of them. I have another question, um, but maybe it's out of topic for this particular session. 
but I'm wondering what you're thinking about in terms of place for behavioral and social sciences in the high school curriculum. So one of the things that I, that would probably be one of those things that they explore during those March to June areas. The, I, cause I have built in here how I want them to explore metacognition, meaning how do they learn? We're also looking at toward in the last or the C year <laughs> um, uh, addiction and how that works on the brain and why that is what addiction actually is. So we're, some of those things, obviously that's not the full, <laughs> the full buffet of behavioral health and behavioral sciences, but definitely giving them that here's this, where this is connected. And then during those months uh, towards the end of the year, hey, you know, some of this, I remember we said something about that. I want to learn more about that. So a lot of the topics that we would love to throw in that are indeed connected to our um, science is we are expecting our students to be independent and ask. And then if it becomes an internship, if it becomes a project, if it becomes an outreach, that may be something that they can explore during that March to June area. I don't know, that's, I think, I don't know, <laughs> Emma or um, um, Natasha, I don't know if that works for you guys. <laughs> yes, 100%. And I'll also just add that I've had a lot of students um, come through the intermediate program and they of course are now in college and have come back and said that one of the things that they really loved the most um, was psychology and having an opportunity to explore that. So honoring that, I would want to, you know, I again, this it's so dependent on what the students' interests are. If they're expressing a great interest in this and they're like, yes, I want to take Psych 101. This is fascinating stuff. Then they can, they're tying that to what they're learning in the science curriculum. But there's also a variety of different avenues for them to explore it more deeply. One, of course, would be prepping for um, an AP Psych exam. One would be um, dual enrollment, taking psych at the community college, or, you know, really diving into some sort of project or exploration around that or internship experience that can kind of give them, give them a foot in that. It's true. It's truly dependent on, on what they, what they want, right? What are they expressing an interest in and how can we help them get to that point? Um, but I also, I'm already anticipating this because I already know from the students that I have that are going to stay on for Fairhaven. They're like, so when are you teaching us about psych? So it's, it's coming. I know it's coming. So speaking as a former uh, high school boy, there I really didn't know what I was interested in. And so like I had to take physics and turns out I was really interested in physics, for example. So, I mean, I love that, that you know, that, that you're building that in, that flexibility in to follow the child, but then, you know, we've got other things on our mind sometimes. So, I, I don't know, that, that's just, it was just a reaction, but uh, so maybe then a specific question about physics is that, you know, because that's another lab situation that requires uh, equipment and stuff. Um, or maybe that can be handled with those uh, virtual models. Definitely. And so, yeah, that cycle A, I think is what we named it, is when we're looking at movement. And so I would say that aside from the AP physics curriculum, we want to expose them. It's more exp um, two different concepts, for example, velocity and looking at it doesn't necessarily have to be a roller coaster. It could be two little matchbox cars on a little a Hot Wheels track, right? So I think uh, I have a phenomenal colleague, physics teacher, who's, you know, that kind of physics teacher <laughs> who does, you know, cool things in physics. So I guess if I'm interpreting your question correctly, we will definitely hit a lot of the major concepts in physics. And if that piques the interest of the young man or the young woman to explore higher and they are seeking to do that AP physics test or exam, we will, like Emma mentioned already, we want them to talk to us and say, oh yeah, that was pretty cool. What can I do next in this concept? So I don't know, if, did that answer your question? 
Yeah, thanks. I also want to add one of the areas that Anika and I had talked about and were sort of like figuring out where it fits was computer science, because we also know that that's something that um, students are very interested in, in, in today's age, it's a super valuable skill. Um, but it doesn't, um, of course, there are many applications to what it is that they are doing that fit in computer science. But when it comes to the the fundamentals of that, it's, it's not necessarily like in the three year cycle overview of that you I don't know if you noticed maybe I'm just pointing it out but there's no computer science in there what and I think that that is truly because it does it does require its own attention and and focus because you are it's like learning a whole new language right of of how to speak machine if you will and so if a student is is particularly interested in that and I know I have intermediates that are like I want to be a video game programmer. That's amazing. Let's see if we can find a way for you to to learn some coding and and do things like that. So that would be a separate a separate course, like an elective, quote unquote, if you will, for them. But of course, if that is their interest, right? There's so many different ways to fit that into what they're doing in more of the the quote unquote lab sciences. And to Kira's point, I mean, I know sometimes. I'm, I've been doing this for a long time now with intermediates and they, Montessori kids in general, it is my observation that they tend to be voracious learners and are sort of Renaissance learners where, and maybe there's something about the elementary curriculum that does this for them, where they just are kind of interested in everything. So when I sit down with them and I'm like, you know, well, well, what did you really love about this? You know, oh, well, I thought this was really cool. And I really liked that. And they could probably tell me what they liked and what they didn't like about every single course that they're taking. And so again, this is where I come back to trained adult guides, right? It's our job to help sort of connect the dots for them a little bit to say, well, you told me that you were really interested in building this thing. And then I also noticed that you were really interested in building that thing. Do you think that maybe you would be more interested in pursuing something that is something you can do with your hands and maybe has to do with architecture and physics, right? They may not be able to see it for themselves at the age that they are because they have so many other things on their mind, but it's our job. If we're doing our job as Montessori guides, we're observing what we're seeing. We're connecting the dots for them and helping them to chart a course that is both going to interest them and sustain them, but also give them all the foundation that they need. So I just wanted to add that two cents there. Are there any questions that you guys were anticipating that haven't come up yet? Well, whoever asked about the lab space, we definitely knew that one was going <laughs> to come up and we were prepared with our answer. <laughs> any good? Did we, was there anything else really that we, um, think when we were putting this curriculum together? There's so much. I love, I mean, it, it's like, <laughs> it has so much, uh, not to use uh, a physics term, potential. Um, it has so much potential energy, but I think, I think we kind of. Oh, I know one. Yeah, go. So, all about assessment and student uh, self-assessment. Yes. Okay. So where we are, Em and I definitely have sort of collaborated on doing more of a rubric based because one of the Montessori's quotes that we used was that, you know, test prep is not really our thing. We want to make them uh, more independent learners. So in that realm, we have more of a rubric style and we're also going to champion a lot of peer and guide support and um, feedback. So I think through each individual con at the end of the unit, they will have some way to demonstrate, not just a multiple choice test, right? But demonstrate that they have processed the concepts, but also are able to build or produce or demonstrate that they understand it. 
So we want to, because science is doing a lot, <laughs> as opposed to a lot of picking different choices on a piece of paper. And so we want them to show that. So after whatever they produce, perhaps it's the model of a skin of the skin, or perhaps it's their own makeshift roller coaster or something that would help us understand, okay, they understand vectors and forces and gravity and all the, based on how they produce this final product. So we have a rubric to help assess. Now they will get the rubric um, well before they start. So they'll know what we're looking for. And as they go through the process, we give feedback. They may call in a peer and say, hey, look at this. Did I, what things would I, what else can I add to my project to make it fit these themes or these requirements? So it's more of a rubric based, although again, for the AP, we recognize that they have a specific, uh, well, now most of them are online, computer-based uh, multiple choice tasks that they have to answer. And so, yes, we will make sure that they are prepared in that realm as well. But true Montessori, <laughs> AP notwithstanding is more project and demonstrating their understanding. Other than that, I think we hit all of the major points. So, does anybody have any last lingering questions? Something we didn't cover? What's the big crowning achievement dissection that they're going to have to do? That's always a big thing. In My biology. favorite topic. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, I will. If it, if I had my way, I would have them dissecting every year something. And so, yes, I know I teach anatomy. So we currently do cats. And I know that's a little offensive to many, but there's nothing like a dissection. So, so I'm glad you brought that up. But yes, that is definitely in my my little mind, in the back of my mind. Well, if there's nothing else that is on anybody's mind at this particular moment, we'll thank everybody for coming tonight and a big thank you to Anika for creating this amazing curriculum and sharing it with all of us. I know that people's brains work differently though. So if you go to bed tonight and you wake up in the morning and you're like, I really wish I had asked that question, please, please, please reach out, reach out to me. If I don't know the answer to the question, I'll pitch it over to Anika and see what she has to say. But we want to be in communication and collaboration with you. So if there's something about this that you're like, I don't know, I, I want to hear more about this, please tell us, right? We, we want your ideas. We want your feedback as we're putting this all together. Um, this is the first of, I think, like six or seven planned coffee and conversations that we're going to do this year about the about the high school. So they're they're all on the Butler activities calendar. They will come out in the Butler bulletin. So you should not be surprised by them. But I know that we'll definitely be touching on college admissions at one point with our college admissions consultant, Wendy Lubick, Senora finished her entire Spanish curriculum over Thanksgiving break, and she's so excited to share it with everybody, going all the way up to the AP Spanish and the Seal of Biliteracy, which she's very excited about. We will, literature is my great love. I cannot wait to tell you all about the literature and history opportunities that are coming up. And Mrs. Daly will talk about math and about algebra two and trigonometry and pre-calculus for your, and calculus for your children. And the last one really is experiential education. So, you know, we're, we're touching on all the main academic components because I know that that's really on people's minds, right? How is my child going to be academically prepared for what comes next? But we wouldn't be Butler if we weren't giving the most incredible, amazing experiential opportunities like international travel, internships, job exploration, a collaboration with other communities, and so much more. So this is just my plug. Stay tuned. 
tell all your friends. We will be holding more of these as we go on throughout the year. So I thank you guys so much for coming tonight. Absolutely. Thank you guys.